Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation in memory of Richard Hefner, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Angelson Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Joan Gantz Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Ever since my attention was drawn to the New York Times review of Astra Taylor's essential new book, The People's Platform, I've been eager to explore her elucidating account of digital power and culture and their transformation. A prize-winning documentarian who probed the insights of our contemporary worldly philosophers in examined life, Taylor has described her own work as the steamed broccoli in our cultural diet. These topics on their surface may be challenging to digest, but Taylor's dynamic analysis is both accessible and, of course, critically important. Once an egalitarian springboard to cultivate American culture through the creativity of the masses, the Internet has now transferred its power, it seems, over to the classical media hierarchies of celebrity. For the cheap laugh has become the cheap click. And according to Taylor, Market forces, rather than the common social good, primarily govern new media conglomerates like Google and Facebook. And their model necessitates the collection of user data, perpetuating the cycle of clickable junk. A people's platform therefore appears aspiration more than reality, which makes us wonder, if not on YouTube or Netflix, how we can facilitate the populist revolt that Astra Taylor craves. How can we empower Americans instead of the corporate monolith? Does it even matter if our cultural norms appeal to the basest exploitative ends? Are we beyond redemption? These are the first questions that I pose to our guest today. As I welcome her, Astra Taylor, thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. Are we beyond redemption? No. Um, I think that you know one of the main points I'm trying to make in this book is that these are man-made systems, you know, the, the internet was made by human beings and as such can be made better. Um, there, there can almost be a kind of technological inevitability, the sense like, well, you know, let's, let's leave it to, to these innovations and, and, and let's see where technology is taking us. And, and um, that's kind of the, the rhetoric coming out of Silicon Valley um, and, and coming out of um, these internet giants, you know, where there's, there's a sense that there's going to be this inevitable disruption and upheaval, and every we should just let technology play out. And, and one of the points of the book is, well, no, let's let's talk about what kind of media and communication system we want, and let's try to intervene and shape it. So, yeah, we're not we're not beyond redemption if we take action. It appears very difficult to undo some of the trends that we've seen toward that cheap click. So what does the process look like to actually recreate that that common good? Yeah. Well, I think we're not that people's platform. Yeah, I think we're not there yet because we haven't really recognized the depth of the problem. And that's one thing that this book is trying to do. There have been a lot of books written about the internet. So I'm kind of entering a really crowded field here, right? And they tend to come in two varieties. They tend to be that everything's, you know, great and getting better and here comes everyone, everyone can participate online and and social media has empowered us to create culture, to create encyclopedias, um, to um, coalesce politically and advocate for causes, and isn't it great? And then the other side of the spectrum says, oh no, we're stuck in the shallows, we're distracted, social media is you know, weakening our social ties and actually isolating us. And, and this book basically says, um, neither of those stories talk about the way that these market forces are shaping these tools. Um, and that it's, it's not just that technology is good or bad, uh, it's that it is 
shaped by the social context that it emerges in. So, mm. so right now, those market forces are dominated by the advertising dollar. And that, that really is the funding model shaping the entire internet. Um, uh, the business model of the internet is surveillance and it is advertising. Um, and if we don't kind of, as a culture, talk about what the, the downsides of that funding model are, then I, I don't think we're even gonna get to a space where we talk about reclaiming it or making it a true people's platform, right? Like we haven't really had a conversation about the social costs yet. Right. I think we're, we're still at step one, and then what to do comes, comes after that, of kind of admitting that we're, we have a problem, we're addicted to advertising, that, that's the only funding structure um, uh, in place. You know? and, and that's what's so interesting to me, is we have this new technology, and it is amazing that we have this infrastructure where you know, we, can, we can communicate many to many instead of the old broadcast top-down model, um, and it is true that, that uh, many old, business models are kind of in a state of flux or possible collapse, but it's very interesting to me that advertising is actually stronger than ever. Um, that these companies, Google and Facebook, are more dependent on the advertising dollars than newspapers of your, television stations of your. And the advertisers have been very empowered because now they can you know, track you as you move about the web and increasingly as you move about away from the keyboard as they're connecting to other types of data collection. So yeah, I think we, we need to talk about the social cost of that being the model that's supporting these supposedly open and free platforms that we depend on for information and to be educated and to apply for jobs and uh, to communicate and read the news and all this stuff. The social costs of big data. So tell me, is that inevitable? I mean, is big data inevitable? I don't, I don't think anything's inevitable. That's why I'm an, you know, besides being a writer and, and being a filmmaker, I spend a lot of time being a political activist and, and working around economic justice issues. So if I thought anything was inevitable, I would not spend precious hours of my time <laughs> on probably well, ill-fated, you know, But that's But campaigns. that's optimism that we <laughs> cherish here. So let's, let's interrogate this a bit more. So to undo this trend, mm -hmm. which is how the wheel is going around now, mm -hmm. Big data that serves advertisers, that serves the bottom line. It doesn't serve populism. It doesn't serve the people. Yes, yes. And so what, what but first we have to think about what is actually going on. So, so we talk about big data. It's kind of a catchphrase right now. And the, and the idea is that through all of our movements in the digital space, we kind of, there's a kind of digital exhaust is a phrase that we leak. These companies just happen to collect it and amass it. And then they go on to, to analyze it um, and to sort us, the users of the internet, into these databases uh, so that they can target content to us, so they can target advertising to us, uh, uh, so that they can not just serve us ads that we'll see, um, but also there's ample evidence that uh, price discrimination comes in. You know, they might offer you something that they don't offer someone who is a, you know, a, a single mother living in a rural area or something like that, or they might um, discriminate in terms of interest rates, you know, not just prices. So they're, they, it's not just a matter of like the advertising that we see on the side of the Facebook page, and mm -hmm. I think that's really key. Um, there's a sort of um, discrimination that is emerging and that is extremely unregulated. This is a brave new world. There's very little government o oversight. So, you know, that's one one example of these sort of larger social costs. I mean, and it's I, it's fascinating to hear you say that because it, it sounds like what could be a start of a solution is web gentrification. I mean, is that really <laughs> what we're what we're talking about? Web gentr so, gentrification in what sense? Well, I'm just imagining your words as a city. I mean where stores do discriminate. Yeah. I mean, if you're in Manhattan or if you're in an outer borough, depending upon your coordinates, you're gonna have certain advertisers. You're gonna have the, the capitalistic system surrounding you. I mean, that's... Exactly, and so what we're having is, uh, is a problem. these are all real world problems. I and mean, when you're saying, you know, when you're using this analogy to the real world, it's like, well, of course, because the internet, the online space and the offline space are the same. So what we see is the same problems, the same inequities moving into the online sphere, and in some, in some cases, amplifying. Which you say were, at one point, more free of some of these socioeconomic yeah, boundaries. Yeah, basically, you know, the Silicon Valley is one of the bright spots in a rather dim economy, right? So a lot of money is flowing there. You know, if you look at the charts, you know, 
advertising globally is $700 billion a year and more and more and more of it is funneling online. So what I'm looking at is, are the trends, the long-term trends of what are we going to see. And I think we're going to see more invasive advertising and data collection um, with more um, types of di uh, digital discrimination emerging. And um, and that's what we kind of have to understand that this is much bigger than just those annoying little like lose the belly fat ads that we all see on the internet. And we go, well, who clicks on those anyway, right? I mean, it it divides people, shows people, you know, shows one category of people something, hides it for another category. Um, and the other thing is that the advertisers shape the actual form of these platforms. Like, why why is why is Facebook organized around the like, right? It, and always, you know. There are so many other things we could do. We could find something important or we could find something interesting, you know, but it's organized around the like because but that's again, that's a very the profit, handy method for. And, I mean, the profit making impetus. Right. We had Sue Gardner here and Mitchell Baker from the Wikipedia organization and Firefox Corporation. And I mean, we, we were discussing this whole that these organizations, they could have gone the more public oriented, public service route mm -hmm. in their trajectory and how they were going to interface with the American public, but they chose not to. And, you know, this book may be an awakening so that the next Facebook or Twitter considers that you're part of a, a society. Right, but I think that's also then the society also has to choose, right, and to encourage Because there that. aren't protests like there are of war, yeah. of internet discrimination. Right, because we haven't totally you know, taken stock of where we are and, and organized for other things. There was this idea, actually, if you read a lot of the sort of... Um, popular internet literature, they point to sites like Wikipedia as the paradigm of what the web could be. And, I, and Sue Gardner has actually made the point, well, actually, the reality is there's only one nonprofit site in the top 100 most traffic sites on the internet. That's Wikipedia. We only have one nonprofit model. Why aren't there more? And my question at the end of the book is, well, why aren't there more public sites? Why, why, you know, why have we kind of accepted this idea that with the advent of the internet, public media is now behind us. Um, well, I can tell you why or what we're told. We're told that public media was justified by spectrum scarcity, that in the old broadcast model there, model, there were limited channels, so we should put one or two for the public interest, have a PBS station, have an interview show like this. But now every, everyone can go online, it's theoretically infinite, and so we don't need that model anymore. But I think the Wikipedia example challenges us because it, it basically says, well, hold on, if, if a nonprofit can't survive in this highly commercialized space, and if we can't actually count on the next Facebook or Google to selflessly declare that they are a public good and that they're going to be a nonprofit, then maybe we have to organize and, and create a public model because you know, that's what people did in the past. If pub, uh, public broadcasting emerged out of the Great Society programs, LBJ, and it was you know, an idea that was in the works for decades and decades that people fought for. It didn't just emerge out of the ether. I mean, you would credit the net neutrality debate for, for perhaps opening this conversation to some extent, but in all honesty, I mean, this is not a thought that percolates. The net neutrality debate is really encouraging. Um, and, you know, former Commissioner Michael Copps has said, you know, we need, we need to um, create an internet for the 99%, and that if we get rid of net neutrality, what we will have is an internet for the 1%, that basically those with deep pockets, we'll be able to pay for prioritized service. Um, and we will have uh, this, this wonderful opportunity um, wasted, basically, as, as we'll see you know, the internet come increasingly to resemble cable television. So I think it's, a, it's an extremely important uh, debate that's happening. And uh, it's foundational. I mean, the internet is kind of, uh, it's often thought of as sort of a series of layers, right? So there's the, the underlying infrastructure, there's the software layer, and then there's the content and the platforms that we all use. Um, so I think we absolutely need to throw down for the net neutrality fight. We need a free and open internet at that level, but then we need to pay attention to these higher levels. I mean, that's where the business models of these companies and issues of privacy, privacy come in. Um, and so I think, you know, one thing I say is you know, an open internet isn't enough. It's just the first step, and then we need to think about what's on top of it. I would, I would like to take a moment. Um, you know, one, one thing we like to do in the United States is we like to point to Internet bad guys. We like to point to Iran. We like to point to China and just say, hey, we're not doing this authoritarian dictatorship, you know, closing off the web thing that they're doing. 
it's a flattering comparison. It's a really good that uh, we are not those countries in terms of internet governance. But you know, I I think if we um, if we blow it on net neutrality, we're, net neutrality, we're really going to fall behind internationally. Already, countries like Chile and the Netherlands have been trying net neutrality. Brazil just passed this massive internet constitution that that um, makes net neutrality and basic privacy protections the law of the land. So, you know, we we pride ourselves so much on being sort of ahead of the curb and, and being the center where Silicon Valley is creating all these amazing, useful platforms. But, you know, we should start looking at at countries where with Know, we don't look so great in comparison. I think that would be a good first step. More, be, more, be humble. More you know? advanced democracy. <laughs> yeah. And then, us. yeah. And I, so I think net neutrality is a battle for regulation, a regulation of the cable companies, right? To say that, that um, access to the internet should be common carriage, that they have some, a public duty to, to treat all bits equally and let people get online, right? Um, well, what's, what are the public duties of these? big info monopolies, right? And so I think we need to, to look at other forms of regulation. Privacy regulation is a really uh, important next step, I think, and I think it's something that people should be, be advocating for, and it should, should take account both of government surveillance, all that we've learned from Edward Snowden in those revela revelations, but also corporate surveillance, and the way that those two are intertwined and really can't be separated. Um, and the, the arguments these companies are making to not be regulated are pretty fascinating, you know? Well, I mean, you know, there's this debate going on about whether they should be able to amass everything, collect all of our data exhaust, it's just happening, and then only be, maybe be regulated in terms of how they use it. Um, some people, and I would agree, that you need, actually need to stop at the collection. You know, that if the data is collected, it's just irresistible, advertisers are going to access it, the government is going to get it. Um, but, but, you know, the fascinating argument is that companies basically say, well, once that data is there, it's their free speech. They have a free speech right to then advertise and to use that data however they see fit. Um, um, so the more power these companies amass, the more power a company like Google amasses, the more that they use it for lobbying in Washington, D.C. to make these kinds of arguments that are really not in the public interest, as much as they present this sort of public-spirited public spirited facade. You know, I, I would say... Um, you know, they're, they're not watching out for us in the end. So besides taking this book on the road, how is the activists in you, and I know you're one, uh, going to lead this, this campaign? Because it's really a book that can be bigger than a book. Um, I think that we do not have a clear progressive flank in the, in the technology debate. And that's real. I mean, it's it's true. My cards are very much on the table. I mean, this book this book could almost be called like Occupy the Internet or something <laughs> like that. You know, and I was, I was quite. Um, that's why I was quite smitten with Michael Kopp's, you know, idea of an internet for the 99 percent because I think that that's what this is. But the one percent is not just the cable incumbents. It's not just Time Warner and Comcast who might actually be merging and right. and be one big monster. But it's also the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebook of the world that are amassing this enormous and amount the, of power. to the degree that they infiltrate the FCC. <laughs> and, or, or in Washington in general. I mean, a, a, a Google engineer was just appointed the sort of chief technology officer by Obama, right? So, and they, they actually are now at the top of the lobbying spending list. They've opened huge offices in D.C. So, I mean, we're, what we're seeing is old power, I mean, you know, new power coming to resemble old power. And this is why I say we haven't had a digital revolution. We've had a re rearrangement. And old hierarchies have carried over. And as long as we keep buying the silly meme that well, everything's different now, we're going to be blinded to how much things are actually the same mm -hmm. um, and, and how little has changed. But, but the, the sort of co the encouraging thing about that is, well, that means old tactics of changing things will actually work. All of those past fights we've had for consumer protections, all of those past fights we've had to create public media, hey, we could take some of those old, old um, tactics and use them now because things actually aren't really that different. Let's not forget the protests, and, protesting in the streets. And people have. I mean, there was the Occupy the FTC protest around net neutrality. Um, uh, I'm, I'm uh, interested to see where protests emerge. I mean, there, there have been a lot of protests around the tech companies in San Francisco. And you know, that has been a response to the fact that these tech companies are getting tax breaks um, and yet contributing to this massive 
uh, inequality in the city and, and pushing long-term residents out to the, um, the hinterlands uh, and using public resources like bus stops to drive their sleek white, you know, um, uh, commuter buses. And so this, this sense that they're, they're benefiting from public resources but they're not giving back to the community. And residents in San Francisco at least have had blockades and, and, and you know, really done sort of civil disobedience tactics. They have actually done tours of houses and visited the, the houses of executives and said, hey, you shouldn't kick out your, your tenants and stuff like that. But I think the basic argument that they're using public resources and not giving back, goes, it, it's really deep. It goes back to the actual beginning of the internet and the computer chip, which the government invested in but people don't know that. Oh, people don't know that state subsidy is responsible for practically all of these innovations that private corporations reap I mean, credit and, and, and rewards. And that's why, of. in the words of Sue Gardner, she didn't. She said she didn't want the internet to become just another giant mall. Yeah, yeah. And this is, and it is. It is increasingly a shopping mall and not a public park. But we still use these metaphors. We still say that Twitter's a town square and Google's a library, but we don't think about how to actually... Well, we don't qualify it. Right, we don't, or we don't think about how to actually make those metaphors real, you know? Instead, the shopping mall It's too difficult. It's, it requires some work, yeah, some and diligence. Some, well, and some imagination. Right. Well, the one thing that was missing here, it, it's, a, it's a perfectly cogent um, and, and essential, as I said in the introduction, book to read, to see the problem, but I want, I want your blueprint. Mm. I mean, and, and I hope that will be a sequel, but you say towards the end, we must find ways to adapt and extend tried and true policies while taking the unique architecture of the 21st century communications into account. And so you, you again um, use the analogy of public, public broadcasting, public means, but, but um, in your, in your conclusion that's not here, and since this went to press, I'm, I'm wondering how are you uh, kind of encapsulating your, your book in, in the context of what to do about the problem? Right. And, uh, you know, the book does lay out what to do in the sense that it says we need to reconceptualize public media for digital age and look at every level, right. every layer of this communications infrastructure. So, you know, running... Um, uh, or, or at least putting some sort of uh, public interest responsibilities on cable providers or offering municipal broadband alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, and many cities are doing that successfully, offering taxpayer-funded broadband. The problem is that these cable incumbents have actually lobbied and got, gotten laws on the books in almost 20 states forbidding communities from doing that, from, from providing broadband for themselves. So there are some very low-level local battles that we, we need to get involved in as citizens, I think. Um, but the next level up is, I think, if, you know, we funding things with the public purse. And, and we're having this, enorm this crisis of journalism. Um, and lots of people sort of like waving their hands and, and you know, decrying the state of, of journalism and how anemic it is and the fact that there's nobody watching City Hall, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the numbers are, I mean, there is, there is cause for alarm. As I show in the book, the numbers are pretty bleak. Um, and yet, we never consider the option of, of uh, publicly supporting that public good, mm -hmm. even though countries with the most investment in public media are ranked again and again as the most democratic in the world. You know, somehow we just think it's advertising or, you know, it's nothing. Um, and so there are lots of ideas. I think, that, I think, I actually think the real question that my book, you know, doesn't address is how do you build political power to get this stuff? That's the right. Well, that's the, that, that's the campaign. Yeah, and mm -hmm. the campaign campaigning is hard, and that's why it's been very interesting to me researching this book and going back and and looking at history and how did this happen? I mean, people started having ideas about non-commercial media and about a more democratic communication system in the 20s and the 30s and the early days of radio, you know, and there, you know, key figures just sort of banged their heads against the wall until there was a political opening that they were able to seize. Um, and then there would be these sort of, you know, gains and then there would be some setbacks and then they'd move forward and that, that's how political change works. That's, right. You have to just keep spreading the good ideas and waiting for an opportunity that you can leverage into some action. But I think the 
you also have to work on the public imagination. And I, you know, one thing that struck me, and it's not in the book, is that um, well, I, I mention in the book that the founders of Google, uh, Brennan Page, actually wrote, a, wrote an academic article that said they thought advertising search engines would inevitably be biased and that we really needed an alternative in the public realm, right? So they're calling at the early days of Google in 98 for an alternative and saying, this is going to not work out if you go the advertising route. I find it fascinating that now they get over 95% of their money from advertising, and yet what they're putting their energy and, and uh, resources into is life extension and traveling to the moon. And I think it, it, there's something really striking about the fact that it seems more realistic to achieve human immortality than to just have an academic search engine. We're running out of time, but I, I have to just uh, throw this out there. It seems to me the one way you could turn people off to the internet is actually turning the lights off and reimagining what it could be. So you're line. proposing some pretty radical civil disobedience, it sounds like. <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> Only Just some thoughts. ideas. Thank you, Astra Taylor. Thank it's a magnificent me. read, and thank you for being here. Cool. Thanks for having me. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other Open Mind interviews. And check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation in memory of Richard Hefner, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Angelson Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Joan Gantz Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.